Wonderful. So we're recording today. This is an interview conducted by myself, Emma Cieslick, on Wednesday, August 17th, starting right about 6.02 p.m. Eastern Standard Time for Queer and Catholic, a CLGS oral history project. I use she, her pronouns. We are recording this oral history interview via Zoom while I sit at George Washington University on campus. And um, Sister Janine Gramick sits at her, her location via Zoom. I wanted to sincerely thank you for your time and for agreeing to contribute to this wonderful project. I really appreciate it. Oh, you're most welcome. Thank you. And starting off, would you mind please introducing yourself? All right. Uh, I'm Sister Janine Gramick. I'm a sister of Loretto. I have been uh, a sister really for 60 years. And for 50 of those years, I have been involved in LGBT Catholic ministry. Uh, I began my religious life as a school sister of Notre Dame for 40 years and had a little confrontation with church officials. So I uh, changed communities and now I'm a sister of Loretto. I've been a sister of Loretto for 20 years. That's wonderful. Would you mind sharing your pronouns with me? Um, she, hers, her. Wonderful. And along with that, you've mentioned that you've been very much involved in LGBTQ plus issues and identity. How do you identify? Uh, well, I don't usually identify. I mean, for, for years, I did not make my orientation public, um, mainly because uh, Father Nugent, who co-founded the organization with me, um, thought it would be better for various reasons, but he has uh, passed away. He passed away in 2014. And actually the first, the only time I've made it public is when I was, um, I don't remember what year it was, probably what was, it was before the pandemic. Um, so sometime before 2019, close to 2019, I was in Poland and uh, one of the people in the audience uh, asked and I, and I uh, replied that I was heterosexual. So that's my orientation and I'm, um, I'm not trans. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. I really appreciate it. So the only, the second person who, or the second time I said that, <laughs> publicly. <laughs> I really appreciate it. Thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> and then along those lines as well, I'm curious, um, when and where were you born? Uh, I was born in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania uh, in 1942. Uh, Philadelphia is a very conservative city, uh, religiously. Uh, it's most, even today, and as I was growing up, it was uh, the majority of the population was Catholic, very traditional Catholic. And in many ways, um, it is the, the Catholic population is still traditional, but coming, coming along. Uh, but I entered the, the School Sisters of Notre Dame in 1960 um, as a traditional Catholic. But along came the Second Vatican Council, and that was really revolutionary. And that re revolutionized my life, actually. Would you mind speaking more to that? How did it revolutionize your life? Um, well, I was in the, in the convent, in the novitiate. We had table reading in those days. We, you know, you would uh, have your meals in silence and there would be someone reading from a book, which was wonderful because you get to hear all these wonderful books. And we read a lot of books about the Second Vatican Council. And um, for the, your viewers or whoever is Catholic would, would know that um, the Second Vatican Council was really revolutionary. It, it um, opened up the church to the world, the Catholic church to the world, before that, there was this fortress mentality in which um, it was thought that if you were Catholic, you know, you were uh, somehow fighting the world. But the Second Vatican Council, the bishops and the, and the documents from Vatican II said, 
no, we are part of the world um, and we need to go forth into the world and uh, the world is good. And um, it, it emphasized, I think, the, the social justice aspect of, of the church. The, the teaching had been there, but not very prominent. And so it became very prominent. Uh, social justice became very prominent after Vatican II. And, and, um, it, and probably because of that, the ministry thrived in the, uh, when I say the ministry, the LGBT ministry that I became involved in, which began in 1972. Um, and I was meeting a lot of uh, Catholics who didn't understand um, and in those days, we didn't say LGBT. We didn't even know there were transgender people. Um, and we didn't say gay or lesbian. We said homosexual. Uh, but there were, there were Catholics who recognized, in, and the Catholics, including my um, religious community leaders, who said that the church has neglected this group of people and they're part of the church. We need to reach out and uh, welcome them and make them feel uh, part of the church. So uh, I, I, I really credit Vatican II and the people of Vatican II who supported this ministry in the early days uh, with, uh, with the foundation of what has, has happened. That's wonderful. And along with that, yeah. I knew you mentioned that there were some people that really spearheaded some of this work, would you be able to identify who those people were related to your ministry? Oh, related to the ministry? In 1972, well, uh, the only um, people really that spearheaded the ministry before 1972 was a group called Dignity, uh, which is an organization for LGBT Catholics and friends and families. And that started in 1979, I'm sorry, 1969 in the West Coast in um, the, the LA, San Diego area. Um, and a group of, they were men, gay men, uh, approached uh, a priest uh, to have a Eucharist, to have a mass. And it became um, a, a weekly thing and then people began to hear about it and it spread across the country. So when I was at the university, um, which is where I, I met uh, the gay Catholic community, um, I had heard about dignity. There were very, there were chapters in, uh, so this was 1972 that I heard about it. Um, and it started in 1969. And in those three years, there were various chapters across the country. So I and Father Nugent, who's the priest that I, I founded New Ways Ministry with, who, who has since uh, died, uh, he um, was very instrumental in starting a chapter of dignity in, in Philadelphia. And when I left the university and moved to Baltimore to teach at the College of Notre Dame of Maryland, I started the um, chapter of dignity in uh, Baltimore and helped to start one in Washington, D.C. So anyway, that's so the prior to my getting involved, really, the only outreach was through dignity. So thank God for dignity. Most definitely. <laughs> thank you. I really appreciate you detailing that. And I know you mentioned you were studying at university. Yes. Where did you attend university? I'm sorry. What did where I? Did, where did you attend university? Well, I got my master's degree at the University of Notre Dame in Indiana, uh, but then I got my PhD at the uh, University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. And I, I chose there, I could have gone to another university, but um, I was from Philadelphia. My parents were from Philadelphia. So I said, oh, I'm going to the University of Pennsylvania so I can see my mom and dad <laughs> and friends and cousins. <laughs> That's wonderful. Yeah. And I'm curious, along the line of schooling, where did you attend primary and secondary school in Philadelphia? Well, if you were anyone from Philadelphia, um, we, uh, if you say you're from Philadelphia and you're Catholic, you say, well, what parish? So I was <laughs> from St. Bartholomew's Parish. I went to St. Bartholomew's grade school and I went to St. Hubert's High School 
in in Philadelphia and then entered the the convent. Wonderful. And I'm curious, my one of my most exciting questions to ask you was what motivated you to to join the specific community? I know were you oh. compelled for any reason to join? Well, I always knew that I was going to be a sister, a religious, uh, from really the age of seven. And um, I, um, so in high school in, at St. Hubert's, we had many different religious congregations of women. They were Sisters of Mercy, they were Franciscan sisters, Sisters of St. Joseph. Uh, it was a huge high school. They were like uh, almost 700 students in my graduating class. As, and there were like 3,000 in the whole school. It was huge, huge. And the faculty was probably like 100 sisters um, of all these different orders. Um, but there were two um, school sisters of Notre Dame. But at any rate, um, each year I was going into a different community depending upon which sister I was friendly with. <laughs> So when I was a freshman, I was going to be a sister of mercy because I liked my Latin teacher. She was a sister of mercy. Then, then uh, as a sophomore, it was the Immaculate Heart Sisters. <laughs> but um, at any rate, um, uh, in my junior year and senior year, I uh, uh, had a history professor, well, sister, and um, she was moderator of the debate club and uh, anyway, I became very friendly with her. And so she was a sister of a school sister of Notre Dame. So I said, all right, I'll become a school sister of Notre Dame. It didn't matter to me really what community I was going to, to enter. They're, they all do good work. So it was because of that friendship with her that I entered her community. Wonderful. That's great to hear. <laughs> and I was really curious with that. I know you mentioned initially that you grew up in somewhat of a traditional Catholic community. I did. Mm -hmm. What did you learn about LGBTQ identity in your early years? Nothing, I <laughs> nothing. No, I, um, I did not even know there were, uh, well, as I said, with the word in those days was homosexual. I didn't, I first heard the word homosexual at the University of Notre Dame when I was getting my master's degree. Um, no, I take that back now that I recall. Uh, when I was a postulant, so that we're talking about 1960, I first entered religious life. And um, there was another postulant who was, we would, we use the term very worldly. <laughs> like she knew what was happening in the world. And she, she told us, oh, uh, when, you know, before she entered the convent, she would go to these homosexual clubs. Now, I didn't know what the word homosexual meant, and I didn't want to ask because I didn't want to appear stupid. <laughs> so, so I never knew what that meant, but I heard the word. But then when I was uh, doing my graduate work, um, at um, getting my master's degree at the University of Notre Dame, um, one of the sisters explained it to me. <laughs> And um, so that's that's how I that's when I came to know what uh, being gay meant. I mean, it's incredible, but I lived a very sheltered, traditional Catholic life. <laughs> yes, and, and probably in those days I wasn't unique. I mean, um, you know, if we're talking about the nineteen, we're we're talking about the nineteen sixties. Yeah. So it was 1968, I guess, when I first knew what a homosexual person was. Mm -hmm. And then in 1972, I met a gay man and his friends and changed the direction of my life. Would you mind sharing more about that? Who did you meet and how did it change things? Well, I don't know if you want the long version or the short version. <laughs> I always love the long version if oh, you have really? time. <laughs> okay. Well, the long version is that when I was a student, my first year as a student, graduate student at the University of Pennsylvania, and you know, nuns always like to save money. 
Um, so I was looking for housing and um, uh, another student told me that there was a, um, a, a, a an Episcopal priest and his wife and their two children who lived in this house and they would give the attic of their house rent free if the person would babysit when the husband and wife went out to any engagement. And so, ooh, rent free, wow. And all I have to do is, you know, babysit. And, they, and some, ba their, their children were like five and seven. So they, were, they weren't babies, but uh, someone to be with their children when they went out. So, um, so that's what I did when my first year as a graduate student. Now it happened that this Episcopal priest uh, was at the Episcopal church um, on campus and the Episcopal uh, church was letting the gay community have their church hall for dances, you know, for, and meetings. They, uh, um, they were engaged, the Episcopal diocese was engaged in an and an outreach to the gay community. And this particular parish hall was, was used. So being curious, I asked um, the rector if I could, if there was some way I could um, like go and to, to like, it was totally voyeuristic, but he said, oh, well you can sell Cokes, you know, or the, the sodas. At, at, the, at their dance. So there I am in my fail selling Coke. <laughs> and um, I, I just chatted and it was, you know, it was a learning experience. And then um, the, this, the rector was also shortly there after this dance, they were going to have a, um, a, a liturgy um, and uh, which is a, a mass. And um, he, he said he would like to have um, the, uh, the Episcopal church, an Episcopal priest and a Roman Catholic priest uh, co-preside. And I knew Roman Catholic priests. So I got a Roman Catholic priest and uh, an Episcopal pre priest and they co-presided. Well, at this liturgy afterwards, someone comes up to me and said, oh, I met you at the dance. And... <laughs> His name was Dominic Bash, and he told me his story, which he, he didn't tell me at the dance, but after the liturgy, we had this long conversation, and he, he said how he had been uh, in the Franciscans for a short while, um, knew he was gay for, well, from the time he was probably five or six or seven, very young, uh, but went into the Franciscans, but uh, stayed a very brief time because he, he said he felt, or I don't know if he was told, but anyway, he left because he was, he was gay. And, um, but he was a very devout, um, very devout Catholic. And um, he said he knew other Catholics, gay Catholics, who would love to come to this to a liturgy such as he had just experienced. He wasn't shy at all, but his, his friends, his gay friends were, were shy, um, thinking they were Catholic and they could no longer be welcomed in the, in the church. So I said, well, let's have a, a, a mass at your apartment for your gay friends. And that's what we, we did. And, and we had weekly liturgies at his home. Um, and then it, it then it grew and, and some other people wanted it at their apartment, but it was uh, for the lesbian and, and those days, as I said, it was the lesbian and gay Catholic community. Wonderful. So, and that ultimately became the Dignity Chapter. Yeah, in Philadelphia. So that's, that's the story of, of Dominic. Wonderful, wonderful man. It's, it's to him that I owe, I owe my life. What mm -hmm. and and all that has transpired. He he was the inspiration. Mm -hmm. But there were many people along the way who nurtured it. Certainly, my religious superiors. I, I I don't like to use that word superior. We call them leaders. 
but then the German contingent doesn't like the word leader because of Führer, but <laughs> at any rate, um, my religious leaders uh, were very, as, as I said, were very um, forward looking women and they uh, appointed me to the ministry after I, well, after I got my degree and I, I taught for several years and when the community had a, another sister getting her PhD who could take my place in the math department, then um, I was assigned to full-time LGBT ministry. Wonderful. What year was that you were assigned to the ministry? Um, 1977. Wonderful. And that's when that's when New Ways Ministry started. And I started it with uh, Father Nugent, who was the priest um, who, uh, the main priest, because we had several, but who was the main priest who said uh, mass for the uh, lesbian and gay community in Philadelphia. Was he the individual who said mass at the different apartments around the community? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. As I said, there were other priests, but he was the main one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wonderful. And oh, I have to tell you a story about that. Oh, good. It's, it's a good story. Uh, Dominic, um, Dominic Indomitable, and he he got so much done because he, as I said, he was not afraid to come to this liturgy that was um, con-celebrated with Roman and, and uh, Episcopal priests. And even though he was gay, he was very, very open. And um, he uh, said that uh, he arranged, I, I, he probably arranged for this and he told me it, when it was coming, but he arranged to have um, an interview with the major newspaper in Philadelphia with me about gays, you know, and the convent. <laughs> At any rate, after this uh, newspaper article came out, um, in conservative Philadelphia in 1972, uh, there were a couple dozen letters. Now, the, they, the people did not write letters to the editor. They wrote letters to me, but they sent it to the newspaper and the newspaper then forwarded the letters to me. So I got a couple dozen letters. And for the most part, there were only a few that were negative. Most of the letters supported what I was doing and said, this is so good. I'm glad you're doing it. Uh, this is what the church needs. And among those letters was one from a, a priest named Father Robert Nugent. And Father Robert Nugent closed his letter by saying, if there's anything I can do, please let me know. So I called him, or I don't know if called or if he gave, probably gave his phone number. Anyway, I contacted him and I said, yes, you can be a celebrant for the, for the gay community. So that's how he got involved. And then he, he, when he tells that story, or when he used to tell the story, he would say, and I've never used those words again. If, if there's anything I can do, let me know. <laughs> See what he got into. <laughs> but but he, no, he was, he was happy to do it. I'm so glad to hear it. And along those lines, what was the year that the newspaper article came out? Do you remember? Yeah, it was 1970, uh, 1972, because it was 71 when I met Dominic. And so this was seven, yeah, the newspaper ar article came out in 70. I have a copy of it. Yeah, I could probably send that to you if you want. But mm -hmm. anyway, it was 72. Wonderful. That would be wonderful. I would love to read it. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then along with that, I know circling back to, I was really curious, you had mentioned that you first asked the question and got up the courage to ask the question of what a homosexual was or who, who that was for a specific sister mm -hmm. in the community. What did you first learn? Well, I don't even remember. Uh, she wasn't in my community. I, it was at Notre Dame. We were both students at Notre Dame. And uh, the um, Notre Dame was having, well, they, they had films like every week. It was, uh, it was wonderful. I mean, you could see all these foreign films or uh, it, it, it needn't be foreign, but all these um, uh, wonderful uh, films. And um, 
one of the films was, uh, I think, about homosexuals, and I didn't know what that was, so I asked her. But, you know, I don't even remember what she said. Oh, but she probably said it's, um, um, you know, uh, men who, like, who, uh, who are romantically involved with other men and women who are romantically involved with other women. Yeah. I, I don't remember. <laughs> No worries. And I was curious, <laughs> along with that, I know that you've you've mentioned a little bit more about New Ways Ministries. Would you mm -hmm. mind sharing more about what the experience looked like of founding that and what that ministry looked like taking shape? Well, <clears throat> it started actually because uh, Father Nugin and I were both um, working um, in 1976, the, the year before we started New Ways Ministry, um, at, at a peace and justice, a Catholic peace and justice center in Washington, D.C., in the suburbs of Washington, D.C., called the Quixote Center. And um, they were, they dealt with any, any social justice issue, okay. And realizing that both uh, Father Nugent and I had experience pastoral experience with uh, lesbian and gay people uh, at one of our staff meetings um, they proposed what well maybe um, this the Quixote Center should take on as a project uh, social justice toward lesbian and gay people so uh, Bob Nugent and I proposed that we start these new ways workshops is what we called them um, we took the word new ways because in that year, 1976, um, uh, Bishop McGovero from Brooklyn had written a pastoral letter called Sexuality God's Gift. And in that letter, he talked about the, the, the need for the church to find new ways to bring the truth of Christ to lesbian and gay people. So we said, yes, we need new ways to do this. So, um, so Bob and I um, devised a, a one-day educational workshop for Catholics, um, and so that's what we did, and then after doing this for a year at the Quixote Center, it was just one of the things at the Quixote Center, and we said, well, we think we should have a full-time ministry on this issue. And so we started New Ways Ministry so that we could devote full time to this uh, educational ministry. And it is an educational ministry. I mean, there, there's pastoral uh, aspects to it, of course. You, uh, you never uh, neglect the pastoral, but we believed, and still I still believe that uh, we need to change structures in society and in the church. And I think the way to do that is to try to educate people to see the need for the change of structure. So it's an educational ministry. Yes. So that's how it started, you know, uh, as a full-time ministry. And, and so that was in 1977. What did some of those educational programs look like and who were they for? Well, they were for anyone who wanted to come, but they were advertised in the Catholic community. And I remember the first one that, <laughs> that was at Holy Name College here in, in Washington, DC. Um, we had protesters at two, two uh, Catholic, traditional Catholics who showed up, who told, um, the, who demanded to see their rector uh, to, to say that this should, should not be, should be canceled. And, and the rector promptly asked them to leave the facility. <laughs> but at any rate, um, uh, so those early workshops uh, talked about um, um, research that had been done. Um, a, a lot of questions that people had in those days were, well, um, is homosexuality an illness? People thought it was, you know, this is, um, well, it was after, well, we used the, the American Psychological Associations and the APA's um, 
information, but that, that was a question. Uh, and what causes it? Are you born you know, that way? Or you know, what makes you yeah, homosexual? Okay. Um, uh, what does the Bible have to say, you know, about homosexuality? And um, what what about the sexual teachings of the church, the um, the sexual ethics, you know? So they were, and then and then we introduced other research about homophobia. Um, so it was it was trying to give people information. Well, the, well, give information in the presentations. And then we would have people break out into small groups for discussion to talk about their experience. And uh, um, yeah, that was basically it. Uh, presentations, at small group discussion and large group discussions. And it was a day workshop. And we took this workshop around the country uh, so that, um, well, it took a couple decades, but um, we were we we touched uh, maybe three fourths of the diocese in the country with these workshops. So we were very pleased, and so they were for anyone who wanted to come, but mainly the Catholic community. And we would have um, we'd have lesbian and gay people come. Um, we never had a tr anyone identify as trans. Um, uh, we we had parents who who had lesbian gay children. We had teachers who presumably were you know they didn't I, well some did identify as heterosexual but you know you weren't asked for your sexual orientation. Teachers, um, um, school personnel like uh, um, those who were in administration, uh, just Catholics across the board. Yes. And I'm curious, how did people respond to the educational workshops? I know you mentioned that there was there were a few protesters, but how did attendees respond? Uh, oh, um, very positively. Uh, they uh, they they were those that didn't know much were glad for the information. Those who already knew the information were very happy to hear it reinforced. Um, I would say in the like the 20 years that we went around the country with these workshops, um, you know, the, I, I mentioned the, the very first one had, had protesters, but I, it, I could count on my, my one hand fewer, fewer than, than five uh, incidents in which we had protests. And sometimes we'd have people who like came and to the workshop and were, you could tell they were protesting, but they were, civil and they would sit there and ask questions and we would engage in rational discussion and that was good that was good but you know the the few times there were agitators <laughs> who weren't interested in discussing at all but that was the minority of people but i i should also say that there there was disagreement and uh, the People maybe didn't come to the workshop, but they came to my religious superiors. And my religious superiors received more complaints than I did. And so they, they did the ministry for me. <laughs> they were doing the ministry too. I shouldn't say for me. They were also doing the ministry. And um, <clears throat> I was just with my one of my uh, former superior generals uh, a few weeks ago, we had a lovely conversation. I said, Pat, do you remember the time when you, you were telling me about this woman who called you on the telephone and was ranting and raving because she heard me on the radio uh, talking about the ministry? And, and I, you know, and I, I asked you, I said, well, what was her problem? What was she concerned about? What? And she said, well, honestly, I think she was just upset that you were talking about the issue. <laughs> That's all it was. You shouldn't be talking about this issue. <laughs> but um, so, so the my religious congregational leaders uh, had to bear the brunt of a lot of, um, you know, protests. <laughs> and one time, a, a different, another provincial, not Pat, but uh, Sister Ruth Marie May, who was, they also, they all were supporting this 100%. And she called me and she said, well, I was, I guess I was with her, I saw her. And she said, Janine, I got a call from the Cardinal. I said, oh, 
And he was upset because somebody called him <laughs> and, um, and, and he, he told me that I should take away your faculties. And that faculties is a, that's a, a term that, uh, that's used for clerics. It's permission that a bishop gives to a priest to uh, say mass or hear confessions or you know dispense the sacraments in the diocese. They give them faculties. And so she said, uh, Ruth Marie said to, to the, the Cardinal, she said, Cardinal, I can't take away her faculties because she doesn't have any. <laughs> <laughs> so that's that was very good <laughs> and then another time she said to me this is the same provincial Ruth Marie she said well a lady complained because um she said uh, you were in a gay bar now I'd like to know first of all how she knew I was in the gay bar was she there but <laughs> at any rate uh, I said oh yes yes I was I was doing a study um well I was getting uh, participants for the study but at any rate I said of course I was in the gay bar I was I was trying to get people to, and tell to tell them about this study and also to invite them to come to dignity this is when I was before I had started new ways ministry and I had started a dignity chapter in Baltimore so um, so that yes they had to they had to defend me <laughs> and they did I'm so glad <laughs> yes they did all of them did and I went through uh uh, you know, I don't know, probably four or five provincials and three or four superior generals and every one of them defended me, even even from to the Vatican, because the Vatican complained too. But Would you mind sharing more about that? I know that's somewhat of a recent development, but I would love to include it in the interview. Well, it's not really that recent. Um, the Vatican started their complaints because of Cardinal Hickey. Well, uh, he was uh, he was a uh, the bishop in Washington D.C. in the 1980s, and uh, so th this is going to be another long story. He uh, had a meeting with my provincial. Well, well, the protocol is that when there are sisters in a diocese. Um, they meet with the bishop um, to uh, once a year or whatever to, to talk about the sisters in the diocese. And, and we had um, the school, this is when I was a school sister of Notre Dame. Uh, this is like early 1980, prob well, probably 1982 or three, somewhere around there. And we had about 30 school sisters of Notre Dame in the Archdiocese of Washington. They, they were all teachers except me. I was doing my um, New Ways ministry. And uh, she told me, my provincial told me that he spent, she was with him for an hour and he spent like 55 minutes talking about me. <laughs> and he could not understand why I was in this ministry. And he went on and on and on about I shouldn't be in this ministry, and I and he said, you know, I the archbishop I did not assign her to this ministry, and my provincial said, well, archbishop, we the school sisters of Notre Dame we assigned her to this ministry, and he wanted her to reassign me, and no, she did not reassign me. So that then he went to the Vatican to complain. So then the Vatican approached um, the superior general at the time, um, uh, who was Mary Margaret, yeah, at that time. And um, the Vatican asked the school sisters of Notre Dame to investigate me and to recommend sanctions. And so they investigated me by talking with me and, you know, what are you doing? And, you know, giving me, you know, I had to give explanations. And um, so there, they responded to the Vatican that, yes, we investigated Sister Janine and we recommend no sanctions. Now, this happened for three times. 
the Vatican asked the community to recommend to, to investigate me and recommend sanctions. Oh, the first one was Mother Georgianne and then uh, Mary Margaret. And um, yeah, so there were a number of superior, and then it was Pat Flynn. But at any rate, um, three times. So, but after uh, not getting the answer that they wanted after three tries, the Vatican appointed their own commission. And that Vatican commission, um, and there's a whole story there, but it, it, everything is too long. The, the results of the Vatican commission was that in 1999, the Vatican uh, issued a notification. And at that time, the notification, uh, the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith was Cardinal Ratzinger, who later became Pope Benedict. And um, so Cardinal Ratzinger, um, the, as the prefect of the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, issued this notification. It was signed by Pope John Paul II, saying that Father Nugent and I should no longer be involved in this ministry. We should leave the ministry. Um, so um, I took a year of discernment because um, frankly, the commission was very skewed. And well, I'll just give you one example. Um, that we had meetings with the Vatican, this Vatican commission, and we had letters of support from Oh, I would say 18, uh, more than a dozen, but not, but less than two dozen bishops where we had gone around the country. And uh, we, we entered them into the proceedings of the hearings, but they were, we found out they were not sent to the Vatican. They were not entered as testimony in, on our behalf. And that's just one example. I can give others, but that's, that's an egregious example of how the commission was not fair at all, in my opinion. So at any rate, I was hoping that the, there would be a reassessment, you know, and um, thousands of people th all across the globe, because it made international news, Catholic news, uh, wrote to the Vatican complaining about this situation. Well, rather than initiating another um, um, a hearing, the Vatican just told the school sisters of Notre Dame, my community and Father Nugent's community that this has to stop, no more letters. Like, so <clears throat> uh, I was called, well, we were both called to Rome, uh, to our respective communities and uh, told that um, we must, um, and this came, uh, unfortunately, from the School Sisters of Notre Dame. Um, but I think uh, my, uh, they were afraid of what would happen if they didn't do it. They were not told to do it, but they were advised to do it by canon lawyers. And so they were advised that if I did not obey and cease and desist and write no more, speak no more, because I had been speaking about the Vatican Commission, not doing the ministry in the, the workshops, but speaking about what I had experienced in this commission. So if I did not cease that, um, I would be ultimately expelled from the community. And I knew this was um, heart-wrenching for the uh, community because they had supported this work all along and they they said, you know, stop, and then after a little while, you can continue. Well, that's not, that was a little pie in the sky. <laughs> so, um, so I, um, I transferred to another community. I transferred to the Sisters of Loretto. So that um, injunction from the School Sisters of Notre Dame, which they felt they had to do, no longer applied at, to me. But then the Vatican started writing to the Sisters of Loretto. <laughs> but the Sisters of Loretto, they got nine letters in the course of a number of years, but uh, they answered them politely, you know, and, but 
you know, I, I remained a sister of Loretto. <laughs> they didn't, they didn't, um, yeah, they supported me. I'm glad. And then we have Pope Francis and then the letter stopped and then Pope Francis is congratulating me for my 50 years in the ministry. So it's a whole new, whole new ball game. <laughs> And but it's, you, yeah. Go ahead. Oh no, go ahead. I don't want to cut you off. No, no, no. I'm, I'm, I'm finished. I, I talk too much. Go ahead. No, no, no. I love hearing all of your stories. Very important to the interview. Well, so feel free your, if you have more no, to say. Your turn. I, I forget what I was going to say. <laughs> and along those lines, I was curious, what year did you receive the letter of injunction from the Sisters of Notre Dame? Um, two thousand one. Uh, no, no. Wait. 1999 was the um, notification from the Vatican. And I spent, and that was like July of 99. And I spent a year going around the country talking about the hearings that we had and how unfair they were and asking people if they thought it was unfair to write and ask for another hearing. Um, but the Vatican didn't like that. And so uh, it was 2000, uh, uh, May of 2000, almost nine months, like having a baby, <laughs> um, that then the, um, uh, the school sisters of Notre Dame put that injunction on me. Mm -hmm. So then I, um, I spent uh, the next year uh, going uh, to the Sisters of Loretto, um, in, in the Loretto process, you, there's a year of visiting Loretto communities to see what they're like, to see, you know, to see if you would like them and they would like you. So the next year was traveling to different Loretto communities. Um, and of course they would ask about the ministry and an opportunity to talk about uh, LGBT issues and and the Loretto community was very uh, progressive, so they were on board. In fact, the Loretto community, I was visiting them, like 2000, end of 2000 and 2001, but in 1985, they had given, I think it was 85, they had given me an award <laughs> for the ministry that I was doing. So they were already on board. Um, and um, at any rate, so then I trans the formal transfer was in 2001, um, but uh, canonically um, there, there's a three year period. So it became final in 2004. So, so that's the sequence of years. Mm -hmm. And then please, uh, as, as a Loretto, of course I, um, continue to work at New Ways Ministry and do um, educational uh, works. And we also at New Ways Ministry uh, do pastoral um, outreach too, because we have retreats for LGBT uh, people. We have retreats for parents. We have, um, um, well, we have uh, not retreats, but well, I guess they're educational for schools, yes. That would be education. Uh, oh, we have retreats for um, gay priests and retreats for lesbian sisters. That's wonderful. How did those get started? I'm curious to ask. Um, well, the uh, let's see, the retreats for parents got started because parents were asking. Um, we knew parents individually, and they said, we'd love to have a retreat. So. We, we set up a retreat and our, I think the first one we had as uh, Bishop Gumbleton as our retreat leader. And uh, he was wonderful. Uh, his, his story uh, ha has been told and there are a couple books out and new ones coming out of, about Bishop Gumbleton. I don't know if you know that name. <laughs> a do? very well-known and well-loved name. Okay, okay. So he gave the first retreat. And um, so the, the retreat for parents started because they were asking for it. Um, the retreats for a lesbian sisters began because a lesbian sister, well, I had lesbian sisters writing to me from different 
parts of the country. And I would put them in touch with other lesbian sisters so that they don't feel alone. And then there started to be a network in different cities. And um, finally, this uh, the, the network, I don't remember actually how it, the first, well, at any rate, somehow <laughs> in, in 2000, we had a, a workshop. It wasn't a retreat, it was a workshop for lesbian sisters and congregational leaders like the mother superiors and formation and vocation directors. Um, and the reason for bringing those constituencies together is the lesbian sisters would feel support from leaders it might not be their community leader. They might not be out in their community, but these leaders who came were, were supportive. And then the, the support of leaders would learn more how to be um, um, it's, uh, how to move the issue, I guess, educationally in their own communities. So, so we began to to have those um, we uh, those yearly. They were yearly um, meetings, and they were workshops. But then um, after, uh, and it has it's been pretty recently. It was before COVID, but uh, maybe ten years later. Uh, the lesbian sisters said, we love uh, meeting with the leaders, but we'd also like to get together with just lesbian sisters. So uh, I guess maybe around 2010 or 2012, something like that, we began to have a, a retreat just for lesbian sisters. But we, and we, they still continue. We, like we had the last um, March, um, this past March, we had um, the workshop for all the constituencies. And um, next year we'll have a retreat just for lesbian sisters. That's wonderful. Yep. And I'm curious, what year did those retreats and those workshops start? Well, see, I'd have to go back into my computer and look at the <laughs> files and look at the uh, brochures. Um, I don't, I can't, I know, I know the first, um, it was around 2000 was the first time that we had the sisters and congregational leaders. And for the most part, we've been meeting at the Racine um, uh, Dominicans uh, retreat house uh, in uh, outside of Milwaukee, Siena Center. They've, that's been the home, not for all, but for most of these workshops and retreats. Mm -hmm. But they've been in different parts of the country. We had one in California. We had one in uh, Philadelphia. We had one in Ohio. Uh, but mostly we've been outside of Milwaukee. And recently, uh, right before the pandemic, <laughs> um, uh, there we had a, a retreat there for priests. And it was... Um, they were pro picketers and protesters. And then when they found out we were having, like in a few months, we're having a, one for the sisters, they picketed and protested the sisters. <laughs> but these were the people that didn't wanna be, you couldn't engage in conversation with. So, yeah. I see. Oh, pardon? Oh, I, I was mentioning, I see, I'm really curious. I, I know you speak, you spoke originally about retreats with, um, with Bishop um, Thumbleton. Would you mind yeah. sharing more about what those retreats looked like, especially supporting parents? Well, again, um, I, I would have to go back and look in, at the brochures and see the, the schedule, but um, Father Nuge and I were not the retreat leaders. We would get like Bishop Gumbleton or, um, uh, some other uh, people to lead the retreats. So essentially the retreats were similar to what we did in the, in the workshop, meaning there were uh, talks, there were presentations that uh, the leader would, would make. Uh, there would be small group discussion by the parents. 
there were a, a big part of it would be the parents getting up. Each parent would get up and tell their story about their their um, child and and how 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 they dealt with it either well or badly. <laughs> and some, you know, had conversions and they felt terrible. But I think for the most part, in my recollection, they, they dealt with it very lovingly and any reservations they had, they held back from their son or their daughter because they didn't want them to, to uh, you know, to, they didn't want to burden them. Um, but they brought their burdens, you know, to the retreat and their burdens were, well, I am so grieved because my gay son doesn't go to church anymore <laughs> or my lesbian daughter. And, and I would say for about 10 years, this was their lament. Um, uh, that was like the, the 90s, in the 90s. And then I saw a change uh, like like around 2000 in the turn, turn of the century um the parents would say well my heterosexual son can get married in the church why can't my lesbian daughter get married in the church <laughs> so th now they were saying what's wrong with this church <laughs> not what's wrong with my child because they're not going to church but what's wrong with this church <laughs> So that was very interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So, and these these uh, parents were pillars of the church. I mean, they were um, people in the parish who, um, you know, were in the uh, in in all of the uh, you know sedalities, and they would be the people who would stay after. Sunday collect and count the collection, you know, with basket. I mean, they were they were devoted members of the parish. They would would be the secretaries or volunteers in the parish. They were very connected to the parish, um, and so yeah. Now they're saying, you know, what's wrong with this church? <laughs> and I'm curious. Along with that, were any of the parents involved in P flag? With any local oh, yes oh um oh absolutely uh uh especially um well i guess not especially lots of them but but i'm thinking of the philadelphia chapter of our parents uh, we called it our catholic parents network was started by catholic parents who who had initially gone to p flag and then they they found out oh but there was something catholic so they came, so they, they called our Catholic parents network. They said, oh, well, that's the Catholic P-Flag. <laughs> yeah, they would go to P-Flag and, and um, get the Catholic parents to come to the Catholic parents network. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So, um, and, um, the, the, and we encourage the parents uh, to form not only a network, we had a base network in Philadelphia, but there were networks in other places in, in um, um, a, a particular parents in Rochester, um, Mary Ellen and Casey Lopata, and they had great support from their diocese and they started a family ministry in, in the diocese of Rochester and that uh, we encouraged them to make it a national ministry for parents. And that grew into uh, a Catholic uh, parents group uh, nationally. Wonderful. Do you know when that was founded? <sighs> Not off the top of my head. No worries. No <laughs> worries. <laughs> but I would say in the, I would say the, in the late nineties. Yeah. But I, I mean, if you want the exact dates, I'll, I can check them for you. But. Thank you. <laughs> no worries for the interview. And I, okay. I'm curious, along with that, you've done a wonderful job of talking about how modern events and historical events have really impacted the ministry you do. And one of the questions I wanted to ask was, how did the HIV and AIDS epidemic impact mm -hmm. your ministry? Well, um, it impacted the ministry um, in two ways, I guess. There was um, the prong that was 
reaching out to people with AIDS. And there were a lot of AIDS ministries started. And there was a Catholic AIDS ministry started by a sister. And a, um, I don't know if he was a priest or a brother. I can't remember uh, in the 80s. Um, but then there was also a group of Catholics who, and we've heard it, who were saying, well, this is God's punishment, you know, for AIDS. Uh, that, uh, I mean, God's punishment to gay people. At any rate, um, the, the bishops wrote two beautiful pastoral letters on AIDS and not, and not saying this is not God's punishment at all. This is a, a disease and we have to work to eradicate this disease and we have to reach out to these, to these individuals. So um, the way it, though it impacted new ways ministry is we, we would, we did not do direct AIDS ministry, although we, we wrote a publication like the Stations of the Cross for people with AIDS, but, but we would uh, steer them, I guess, to the Catholic AIDS ministry. And we would, we would continue to do our educational LGBT work. Um, so, so I guess it had, you know, the positive effect of bringing more people into our ministry and then uh, a little negative effect. But th those are the people, I, I don't know that you're gonna reach them at all. <laughs> I, I don't know. I, I have hope. I have hope. I shouldn't say that. I do have hope. I hope so, so too. But yeah. you're very true. It's a very sad, unfortunate event. But I'm glad yeah. your ministry was there to offer yes. that. You mentioned a Stations of the Cross. Uh -huh. what, what did that look like? Well, it took each of this, um, the 14 Stations of the Cross and did like a little meditation on each station uh, and, and focused it on people with AIDS. And so um, in one of our pilgrimages, we, we, uh, that was another thing, we, we did pilgrimages to various Christian sites. And the, the very first pilgrimage was to the Holy Land. And in Jerusalem, we did the Stations of the Cross and we used that booklet at each station and prayed um, with, the, with the prayer there. So. I'm curious, yeah. what did the pilgrimages look like? When did those start? first start? Um, probably around nine, the late 90s, maybe 1997. Maybe that was the first one. Um, and um, basically we went to uh, holy sites and um, we would have mass each morning and then go to the pilgrimage. Let's say, let's say it was the Holy Land. So we would go to the Mount of Beatitudes, you know, one day, um, and uh, another day to the Sea of Tiberias, and and, and recall um, uh, it, the gospel stories, you know, connected with those places, or go to Capernaum and see the place where allegedly this was Peter's house, you know, in, in Capernaum. Um, so uh, we would go to these Christian sites and, and we had a guide, a tour guide, uh, who would give us information, archaeological information, and, um, and we would pray there. And uh, then in the uh, evening, uh, we would have a reflection period of like, what did the, what did the day mean to you? You know, let's bring that to prayer and share some of the um, responses that you had to to the day so uh, yeah and and we went to different uh, the, I, I just detailed the holy land but um well we went to germany and um oh spain france greece you know different places like in greece we would do in the footsteps of saint paul where he he went but anyway <laughs> And I'm curious, who went on these trips? Was it people that were involved with the ministry workshops? Um, well, maybe we don't. I've, uh, we we have a mailing list, and we would just advertise it to the mailing list and um, and tell them to tell their friends, and anyone who wanted to come could come. It was for LGBT Catholics and their families and friends. Wonderful. 
Mm -hmm. But we haven't had any pilgrimages since COVID. <laughs> yeah. Well, along those lines, I'm curious, how has COVID impacted your, your ministry? Well, it has impacted it um, in, um, I, would, I don't know if I should say negative ways, by shutting down some of the things we did, like the pilgrimage, but opened up opportunities through Zoom. So that while we were going around the, the country doing workshops uh, with Zoom, we did workshops with uh, people in the Philippines, uh, a, a Catholic college and university there. Um, we did workshops with people in Brazil. Uh, we've, and we've, we've had Zoom presentations in which we have people from all over the world, like Zooming in, uh, like at our, we've done um, celebrations of pride for pride day and uh, so they come from all over the world to celebrate pride um, so so it, in one sense it has increased the ministry uh, and broadened it to people that would not have been able to physically attend so it has its benefits so every cloud has a silver lining. <laughs> Very true. <laughs> yeah. And I was curious, I know earlier you had mentioned how the transition from Pope Benedict to Pope Francis affected your ministry. What mm -hmm. effect did that look like? Well, the, um, the biggest effect is that we have been in correspondence with Pope Francis. And uh, that has opened up doors to people who may have felt um, a, a little intimidated by us because of the sanctions from the Vatican on Father Nugent and myself. Well, the sanctions on Father Nugent and myself came in 1999, but also New Ways Ministry itself, because I, New Ways Ministry is bigger than me, bigger that I should say bigger than I <laughs> um, because we have you know other people here um, the director associate director and spirituality director etc cetera, etc cetera. but um, in 2010 I believe it was uh, the U.S. bishops um, came out with a statement against New Ways Ministry not against Father Nugent or me, but against the organization. Uh, and that was basically because um, Frank DiBernardo, who's the executive director, and I were, were um, um, testifying for um, marriage equality. Um, I mean, uh, I, uh, to put it in a Catholic context, I mean, we would say uh, testifying uh, for civil unions for LGBT people, not marriage, but civil unions. And um, so the, in 2010, the bishops, uh, the US bishops, the president of the US bishops conference said that we could no longer be considered a Catholic organization because we were encouraging or fostering or supporting um, these um, civil unions. Well, um, um, Frank DiBernardo, uh, last year, well, to, yeah, 2021, um, he got to thinking, and we should have maybe thought of this sooner, but he said, you know, we were condemned by the U.S. bishops for testifying for gay rights, you know, for civil marriage, and um, Pope Francis, when he was in Argentina, also advocated civil unions for same-sex couples. So here is the Pope, well, before he was even Pope, advocating for civil unions, and we did the same thing, and we get condemned for it. <laughs> so, so we wrote to Pope Francis and explained everything. We explained in great detail about the the CDF sanction on me and Father Nugent, and we explained about the um, U.S. Catholic bishops condemning the organization, and um, he wrote us a beautiful letter. Um, 
And so since then, we have been corresponding with him, and he likes what we're doing. Wonderful. Yeah. <laughs> Did that in any way change what the, the Conference of Bishops said or their ruling? Uh, no, because uh, if you know Catholic um, politics, Yes. <laughs> um, I mean, it is amazing that Pope Francis has issued an apology to the indigenous people in Canada, you know, and uh, he is he is absolutely wonderful. But um, it is not usual for any bureauc any Catholic bureaucracy to say we made a mistake or to rescind what they said. So it, the, the way it's dealt with is you ignore what happened in the past and you go on as if it never happened. So that's what we're experiencing. So there's gonna be no taking, the, like the, the Congregation for the Doctrine of the Faith, which, which issued this um, uh, decree is not going to take it back. Um, and the US bishops, uh, I know are not going to say we made a mistake, but you just proceed as if it didn't happen. And now what we say is, um, but Pope Francis uh, likes what we're doing. And, you know, he has, we have his letters to, to say that. <laughs> so, I'm so, so that makes it easier. <laughs> yeah. And along those lines, so, Oh, go ahead. Well, yes. well, no, I was just looking at the time. I, I don't know how long you had anticipated this interview to be. They're but. typically between an hour and an hour and 30 minutes and 45. Oh, okay. If you have any time constraints, that's totally fine. But I always like to get a really round picture of everything. Okay. All right. You can continue that for a little while more. <laughs> Wonderful. Let me know when you have to go. No, no worries. <laughs> well, I would say like an, an hour and a half. Uh, I'm, I, how long have we been? I mean, I'm look, my clock is up there. So it works perfect. It's about 15 more minutes if okay. that works well for you. Okay. Wonderful. And one of my questions is really thinking. Forward. I mean, we could continue, but like I'm, I'm just fading. <laughs> no worries. No worries. Okay. I think I only have one more question, if okay, that would be good. okay, and then we can close it up. No, I don't okay. want to push it all. Okay. <laughs> what do you see as the future of New Ways ministry moving forward and the future of LGBT identity in the Catholic Church? Well, the, the future of New Ways ministry, I think, is quite bright. Um, and I, I, uh, I think um, we will continue to have more influence in the Catholic community. What I envision way down the line, and I will not be here to see it, and I think the people involved in new ways won't, won't be here to see it, but we have, you know, we have, uh, what I envision is that there will be no need for new ways ministry or for dignity or for the Catholic Parents Network, you know, for, like, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be a big issue. Um, but we have a long way to go because like, I think right now, the issue is the trans issue in the Catholic community. I think by and large, Catholics have accepted lesbian and gay people. I mean, if you look at the opinion polls, um, well over 75% of Catholics support civil rights, even, even um, uh, civil marriage. They're not uh, uh, supporting sacramental marriage yet, but civil marriage. So, um, and, and that, I think, is due to the fact that so many uh, lesbian and gay Catholics have come out to their families and their families realize that th these are the, the people I love and they're still the, the same people, whether they're heterosexual or, or gay or, or lesbian, it doesn't matter. But now the big issue, I think, is the trans issue. And um, there, there are some very courageous um, transgender Catholics coming out, but they're uh, fewer and far between. And that's the issue I think that we have to grapple with now. But long-term, like um, my vision is that we won't need, there, there's an organization called Trans Catholic uh, started by a, a wonderful trans woman who's a, a friend of ours. 
But at any rate, uh, the long-term vision is that we won't need any of these organizations, that, that we will be the church that Jesus envisioned, the church that accepts everyone, no matter what your gender, no matter what your sexual orientation, no matter what your gender identity is, um, or your gender expression. It, like we are all flowers in God's beautiful garden. So, um, but the, the, the simple answer to your question of what do I envision for the future for New Ways Ministry, it, it will just be easier because of uh, Francis's support. Oh. That's wonderful. Mm -hmm. So um, we have a new booklet out, if I may be um, permitted to give a little. Go for it. <laughs> Let me see if I have it on hand. Uh, no, I don't, but I'll give you, oh yeah, here it is. Here's our newest one. Um, this is A Home for All, and it is based on the social justice teaching of the church, which is what we all must follow. And um, as you see, the, the um, Catholic call for LGBT non-discrimination, if we are following the social justice teaching of the church, which we are called to do, then we won't discriminate against LGBT people. So that's um, one. And I'll, I'll give you my little, uh, my little spiel too. We have a book for parents called Blessed Parents. Um, it's stories from parents who have LGBT children. And then I mentioned lesbian nuns and we have even a bigger book called Love Tenderly sacred stories of lesbian and queer religious. And this is, this is a beautiful book, I think, of, with about a couple dozen stories from lesbian sisters, um, some of whom are still afraid to use their name, they use pseudonyms, but they're telling their story, they're coming out. So, and uh, um, anyway, so there's some wonderful. of our, yeah. I'm so glad you shared them. It's wonderful to see the output this work it grants to the Catholic community. And there's another book, I don't have a copy here, darn it, but it's uh, a book about Michael Judge written by the, our executive director, uh, Frank Bernardo. Michael Judge was a Franciscan priest and you may know the name or you may not, but um, he was a Franciscan priest in, in New York who was the chaplain for the fire department and did outreach to all kinds of marginalized people, people with AIDS, out, people who are, have alcoholic problems, uh, uh, people who had no homes. I mean, anyone who was dispossessed. And uh, he's the first, uh, when 9-11, when um, the tragedy of 9-11, when it was broadcast, he, he went into the burning building because he, he was a, a, a chaplain and he went to save people. And, but he was the first one carried out. He was the first victim of 9-11. Oh my goodness. And um, he's called the saint of 9-11. Um, and he was a gay priest. And so we are hoping that he will be canonized as our first first known gay saint. Of course, we have gay saints, but we it's not recognized that they're gay, but he was a gay, a gay priest, so. That would be wonderful. I'm so glad yeah. you included that in the interview. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. Wonderful. Along those lines, was there anything else you'd like to include before wrapping up the interview? No, my mind is so dizzy. Um, I can't, I can't think of anything else. No worries. I wanted to thank you so much for participating in this interview for Queer and Catholic, a CLGS oral history project. I'm going to conclude the interview now. I really appreciate your time and help and support of this project and all of your work in support of the LGBTQ plus community. And I want to support you and, um, and uh, the Pacific School of Religion. What you're doing out there is wonderful. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Here, I'm gonna... in, fact, in fact, we've had some of our sisters uh, here um, do, um, I don't know what it's called, but a little 
a little uh, Zoom session, I guess, with uh, your group. That's wonderful. I'm so glad to hear it. <laughs> I know they're working right now to develop a Catholic roundtable as Good. part of their, their, their Center for Studying Gender and Sexuality Studies. Wonderful. Well, thank you. Blessings so on all that you're doing. Thank you so much. It was so wonderful meeting you. You're welcome. Nice to meet you too. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. You're welcome.